Hello, everyone. We're just going to wait a couple more minutes. Um, also waiting for the man himself to arrive. Uh, so hopefully we'll get started a couple of minutes after two. Talk of the devil. Hello, sir. Are you well, Tarek? Uh, I'm good. Thanks. How are you? Yeah, very well. Glad it's Thursday. It's felt like another long, a long week. Um, not that same. It's all the same now, man. Thursday, yeah. Friday. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, what what am I going to do this weekend? I think I think this weekend I might do something different. Just stay <laughs> in the house and not and not leave. Um, go, go crazy. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But I did get a, um, I did get a, uh, what's the word? I can go to the supermarket. I applied for a, uh, an allowance, Perm a permit. Yeah. That's the word. Yeah, a permit. So yeah. I have a pretty exciting trip to the supermarket to go to. Uh, take some pictures. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm in Abu Dhabi, so we, we don't have the full lockdown yet. It's, it's only oh, in the evening, God. so we yeah. roam freely to the supermarket. <laughs> <laughs> how, how different does it, is it kind of the same feel in Abu Dhabi as it was in Dubai? Sort of, I mean, can't tell. I've, <laughs> I've been home for the last two weeks, so uh, I think so. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, it's, it's definitely a strange time we're living in at the moment. Sure. Is anyone still going to Astrolab at all, or it's like... No, well, we've, the, the space is technically still... Uh, you can access it through your security cards, um, just in case, if, you know, people have, like, sometimes leave passports or whatever it may be that they need to access. Um, but no, none of our staff are going there and, and pretty much it's, uh, it's in complete lockdown. Uh, and next, and then, I mean, it's next, technically meant to end next week, but I, I think we're all expecting it to be extended, extended a little further. Yeah, yeah. Let's hope it's just a little, not, not too much. Yeah, exactly. But we were still having, yeah, like um, about 20, 20 to 25 people daily coming into the space until this week. Um, oh, wow. Okay. So, I mean, a part of the advantage is it has outdoor space. Um, and I, I think there's actually a couple of people still going to the space. Um, okay. Just kind of hiding in the back rooms as a way of getting out of the house to a certain extent. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> the, the park next to you helps. So. so. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Exactly. So I think uh, I think a lot of people will actually be allowed to leave their house, even if it's, I mean, I... I uh, ran up, we're on the seventh floor in, my, in where I live, and I, I did a up and down the stairs and today I'm regretting it. My, my calves are in absolute bits. And <laughs> yeah. It's, uh, That's your exercise for the week. Yeah, exactly. Done. <laughs> yeah. Gym. Check. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. But no, so, I mean, it's, um, we are, we've, we're launching Astrolabs and launching a couple of new uh, kind of virtual incubators with some of the big universities in the region. So they're all kind of um, starting quite, quite at the moment, which is, um, Super exciting, um, a little bit daunting. I think there's definitely a skill to using Zoom well and engaging, keeping people engaged, keeping, you know, and I, I think that all of that learning process will, will be coming for sure. Nice. I, uh, it seems we're engaging with a company in Germany. They're all about uh, mental fitness, mental health stuff. Mm -hmm. So um, there's some coaching and some activities and an app and whatever. Uh, we haven't started yet, but it looks pretty cool. So uh, I connected Roland with them today as well. So maybe yeah. they're offering something free for startups. So it might be one of the perks that you give. Yeah, I no, think for sure. Mental health is becoming more and more important uh, <laughs> with everybody yeah. uh, going insane at home. Yeah, this, I mean, it was interesting. I was, I was talking, I'm, I'm part of a, a think tank back in the UK about uh, mental health and loneliness. Um, it's a group of kind of... Um, sector experts that come together to discuss it. And we were discussing uh, yesterday uh, p the potential positive impacts of this, because I think people have a much better understanding because they were forced to live in this isolation about, you know, actually how important it is to get out and exercise and to uh, kind of the, the need for, and the benefit yeah. of so social engagement in a real kind of um, very practical way. <laughs> Talking um, to real people. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. Um, so there, there may be some interesting, um, side effects that can, can benefit that. And actually, you know, for a lot of people, you know, particularly in the later life where isolation becomes a massive problem, um, it might open the eyes to a lot of people being a much more understanding of some of the issues being faced by, by parts of our more vulnerable parts of the community. So, um, 
Yeah, I mean, it's interesting. We've held quite yeah, a few. The elderly and yeah. Yeah, exactly, exactly. We've had quite a few different things for our for community members. So we had like a an online yoga session. We've had kind of like talks coming together, and I would say they are um, mediocrely successful so far. I think it's I think it's hard to try to get people uh, to to come on to online. Um, yeah, we um, did it. We but we'll uh, we'll see. We've got to got to keep trying, you know. I tried one of those. Uh, never done yoga before. It's like uh, I use that app Enhance for uh, personal yeah. fitness trainers, and the coach recommended I try this uh, virtual yoga session. So I tried that last week. It's, it was actually pretty okay. I mean, it's uh, it's qu quite intense for me, <laughs> but uh, the experience with Zoom and all that we projected it on the TV. So it was oh, okay. cool. It's not too bad. Yeah. 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 I mean, my, um, my partner is a yoga teacher and she's taken me through a couple of classes and I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm definitely not, I've only done it three or four times and I'm always yeah. so much more exhausted afterwards than I yeah, kind of expected. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So. It looks much easier than it really is. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You just, you just hold your hands like that. That's easy. Uh, what are you doing? And then you're like, just shaking. Do it for 10 muscles. minutes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Um, well, we'll get, we'll get started. Um, so hi, hi everyone. Thank you for joining, uh, the call today. Uh, super excited to have Tarek here, uh, with our CEO, um, and, uh, part of the Astrolabs community. Um, I think most of you will be aware and understanding of what Astrolabs community is, but we're effectively a, a co-working and licensing space, uh, based in JLT that helps support tech and, and entrepreneurs um, with their businesses. And, you know, luckily enough, we have had some really successful ones. And I, I would definitely put um, Tarek and, and his team at, at Seas as, as, as one of our, our gold stars who are, who are doing well. Um, and, and yeah, so I think what, what we're trying to do is bring together an opportunity to speak to some of the successful entrepreneurs and CEOs of our community, because I think there's so much we can learn from um, their journeys, their experiences, the mistakes that they've made, um, the, the tips and tricks. So with that in mind, uh, we're doing this series of uh, CEO talks. Uh, this is the second one in, in the series. Um, and yeah, thank you so much for joining us, Tarek. Really appreciate it. Um, so doing a bit of uh, stalking of you and, and Googling, um, you uh, clearly are a very impressive uh, person. You are entrepreneur of the week in about 20 different magazines. Um, it was the same week. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. it, was, it, was, it was a good week. It was a good week. <laughs> yeah, ex exactly. Um, but I also looking, you started your life in banking and, and the kind of private equity sector, and you've ended up um, effectively looking at selling cars. How can you just tell us a little bit about that journey and how you, you got from, from one side to the, yeah. to the other? Sure. So uh, I started my career as a strategy consultant with uh, Booz Allen, uh, spent a few years with them. Then I moved into investment banking with Deutsche Bank, uh, working in mergers and acquisitions in London. Moved back to the region, got into private equity with a company called uh, Abrash Capital. It now uh, imploded. It was uh, big on the news. Uh, after Abraj, I joined Mubadala in Abu Dhabi. I was working on their aerospace uh, subsidiary arm. They want to send a rocket to Mars and they do all the satellite surveillance. And during that whole period between Abraj and Mubadala, I was also a venture partner with a few VC funds like uh, Wanda. Mm -hmm. So uh, towards the end of my time with Abraj, within the four years, I started focusing more on the SME investments which at the time there was no venture capital really. That was 2010. So uh, that was effectively VC. Uh, and then with Wamba as a venture partner. So I started, you know, interacting with a lot of startups, with a lot of tech companies and all of that. And uh, it just sparked my interest, A, in technology. I don't come from a tech background. But B, really, you know, the whole entrepreneurial journey, it's, uh, it's quite exciting when you're on the VC side and you're interacting with all these entrepreneurs. You know, you see the passion, you see the drive, you get to, you know, the craziest, newest ideas out there. And it, uh, it really sparked my interest. And then um, one day I was, I was, I'm Lebanese, so I was in Lebanon, uh, sold my car. I was moving back to Abu Dhabi and I, uh, I saw a Mini Cooper on the street and I told a friend of mine is like, uh, you know what, maybe I'll buy a Mini Cooper for a couple of months before I leave. And, you know, I've always been curious about it. And I'm like, how much does this car cost? And he's like, I don't know. 
I'm like, uh, let's Google it. Like, which year do you think this is? Like, I have no idea. So I was like, man, there should be an app where you can just snap a picture of a car, like Shazam for music. It tells you what the car is, how much it costs, and all of that, and, and you move on. So uh, that's where the whole idea for C started. We started talking to potential developers to do it and all that, and then we got rolling. Eventually, we raised some money. So I started it on the side initially. Uh, so I kept my job at Mubadala, and I kept on doing this. And then we raised some money from VCs, so I, I had to take the dive officially. So uh, I left <laughs> and uh, been doing that for three years. Yeah. So, I mean, it's, it's quite the, the classic entrepreneurial story you know when you you read a lot um, about startups and one of the bits of advice always is find the problem that you're facing and it's likely that other people are facing the same thing and in, in this case yeah. it was it was exactly that yeah there was a problem with that though so <laughs> once we we realized it's a problem and and we solved it we at some point early on in, in our journey we realized it's it is a problem but no one is going to pay you a lot of money to, to really snap a picture of a car right yeah. So over time, we had to evolve our business model to, you know, match the problem with, with, with the real business as well. Yeah. And how many times, I mean, that kind of, that pivoting is, is, is so common in the entrepreneurial journey. So how many times do you think you made major pivots in the, let's say, the last uh, three, three to five years? Including yesterday or up to... <laughs> <laughs> like, we, we pivot a lot. <laughs> But like ma majorly, basically, so the first version of our app was uh, Shazam. You snap a picture, we tell you what the car is, and then we show you all similar cars around you, sort of a marketplace angle. Uh, then, then, which people were listing their cars with us. Then we realized, you know, there's a lot of classified, there's a lot of marketplaces. It's, we're not really solving a big problem. Ironically, we just raised money in, uh, in April of that year, in uh, March, sorry, of that year. And then in May, me and the team decided that, yeah, that's not really solving a big life problem. We decided to actually kill the app. It's not like we changed it. We killed it on the app store. We had wow. 20,000 users by the time. And we launched a fresh brand new app that we kept the camera part, you know, the image recognition, but we changed everything else. It, was, it became an aggregator. It gives you price valuations. We had a chat robot that negotiates for you and all that. So... We really changed everything in, in, in that app. It was a, it was a weird uh, discussion with the investors that just gave us a couple of million dollars <laughs> telling them we're killing the app, but uh, it was the right thing to do, so. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's an interesting, um, we talk a lot about kill criteria. You know, what are the things that if you don't get this much traction, if, the, if your customer validation doesn't deliver this outcome, you know, we have to we, we have to say this is not the, the right business venture um did you have very clear kill criteria before you you closed off the app or was it more of a kind of a feeling of do you know what guys this is just not not working yeah it, it was the latter probably so it's, it's honestly i mean unless your app or idea really sucks it's I think it's <laughs> very hard to get very clear kill criteria right because there's yeah. always something that's going okay and in your early stages, you know, okay, sometimes is, is what it should be. You know, it's, it doesn't mean it's bad. Yeah. So, um, and, and in our case, it, sorry, you have that, that optimism of entrepreneur, which yeah, you need yeah. as an entrepreneur to be able to push through um, some of the hurdles. All the crap, yeah. yeah. So, yeah, totally. So, for, for us, no, it was more of a, that's maybe where my consulting background kicks in. Like, like it's, 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 it's the consciously being able to step back and think, okay, guys, you know, we're doing this, but is it the right thing to do? Should we be doing something else? And that's what I think, at least from my VC days, a lot of entrepreneurs don't do well enough, right? They, you dive into it and you just keep trying to make it work. And really the ability to step back and say, okay, is, is, this, is this the right business model? Is this the right market? Is this the right team? Maybe am I the right CEO for this thing? So really oh. questioning all these big things. Uh, we have something pretty funny uh, now that you mentioned it. Uh, at Seas, it's called uh, once a month, we have uh, something called Forward Day, FWD, okay? Uh, I'm going to swear, so I'm sorry about that. <laughs> it's, okay. it's, basic, it's basically, what the fuck are we doing? So FWD <laughs> a day. And it's basically uh, once a month, we all just literally step back and say, should we be selling cars? It's literally to that extreme, you know, like, uh, and, and, and it's good to have these, you know, 
massive wake up calls sometimes. Sometimes we really, it tells us, listen, guys, we're, we shouldn't be doing this. Let's stop it. You know, we've, mm. we've gotten too attached to it, but it doesn't make sense. Mm. And has there been any big uh, realizations out of, out of this FWD meetings where you've gone, God, why, we shouldn't be doing that? You know, are they, are they successful or are they um, often find more about reconfirming that you're on the right track? No, no, they are quite successful. I mean, it's, it's, they happen more in the form of, uh, let's focus on the right stuff. So uh, it's yeah. just about, because this is totally stupid, let's stop it. It's more about, okay, I think, you know, we've been focusing a lot on this one. I think we should shift our focus and focus to this, this other thing. Yeah. It's funny, back in, um, back in the UK, I used to work with a couple of big charities. And one of the tests that we had was called the Daily Mail test. So the Daily Mail is this big national newspaper. It's one of the, I suppose, lower quality newspapers. So lots of like stories about that. Yeah. that. And we always, and stuff, yeah. yeah, exactly. And we always, the Daily Mail test was, if the Daily Mail found out and put this headline on the front page of their newspaper, would we be in, in trouble? Like, does it look bad? <laughs> if it passed yeah, the Daily yeah. Mail test, then-, then, that, then That's yeah. a good litmus test, yeah. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Um, and just, just for everyone on the call as well, we're gonna, there will be a, a time for some specific Q and A's um, later in, in the call. Or if you want to, please drop your questions in the chat and I'll, uh, I'll pick them up from, from there. Um, I just want to take you back a little bit to something you were saying at the beginning on that journey where you've kind of seen the problem um, and you, you were starting to kind of build an I idea. Obviously, with your consultancy background, um, I'd love to hear a little bit more about you know, what taking that very step, first steps from idea stage to kind of um, the validation of the market, product market fit. You know, was there, were there any particular really key things that you think really are important for any entrepreneur to do early on, maybe before they've spent three months um, thinking the idea yeah. is, is great? I mean, it's the obvious stuff. I, I think, you know, I, I, I drive from Abu Dhabi to Dubai every day. So I listen to a lot of audiobooks, probably like three a week. Wow. <laughs> so the ideas typically tend to repeat themselves. So there's, there is, there isn't much that's, that's new there, but it's really, you know, make sure it's a large enough market, make sure you can monetize that idea. And, and that second one is, is very tricky because in a lot of cases, it, it feels like it's monetizable, but often it's not. Uh, if you can, don't rely on an advertising model where you say, yeah, I'm going to have a 2 million users and you know, charge for ads because the Middle East is too small for that and it's too fragmented in terms of countries. Uh, and try to test, you know, as, as dummy of a version as, as it is, as you can. So in our first, for example, before we launched our chatting robot that, you know, negotiated car prices for people, we went out and I asked people at work, I said, Hey, which car do you want? And he's like, I want this car. I'm like, okay, I'll uh, go research all the 28 websites in the country for you myself. I'll mm -hmm. contact the sellers. I'll negotiate and I'll send you a list of the three top things. Is this something you would like? And he's like, yeah, would you pay me X for that? And then mm -hmm. literally do it manually before you go hire three AI engineers to build a, you know, AI chatbot for you. So yeah. there's a lot you can do manually. And so, so try for that, make sure it's monetizable and uh, make sure you can attract the right team. Cause sometimes, you know, you have the greatest ideas and, and you just, are not able to to have the team on board to really you know realize that vision and, and when you're when you're at that early stage what for you what were the what were the key things in in attracting a team and 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 what you know your first hire or your first you know what what would you look for to kind of build a team that's funny because I, I brought my nephew man <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> I, mean, I, I, I i play the blood the blood card <laughs> yeah 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 um, so basically, I'm I'm a I'm I'm more on the business side. I'm not a tech guy. I'm not even an automobile. I don't even like cars. So uh, <laughs> my, my brother is 18 years older than me. So my nephew is 28, 29. So he's he's uh, old. About, I'm actually closer about to your age. Than, yeah, yeah. than my brother. Yeah, same age. So uh, and he's more techy. So and we needed a lot of AI skills. Mm -hmm. And his mom is Danish. She's been born and lived in Denmark all his life. So it was easier for him to get that skill set on board. So, uh, but yeah, but, but you still need to sell a vision. I mean, it's, uh, I, I didn't uh, force him to join. You still need to have that vision and really sell the idea. So being a good storyteller is really underrated and, mm -hmm. you know, and, and being a founder because you needed to get your team, you needed to get your uh, investors, you needed to get your clients as you start. So it's, it's one of the most important skill sets you will need. 
Mm. And, uh, and very recently, you closed your six million dollar Series A round. So congratulations! So lucky. Uh, that is incredible. Um, yeah, I'd love to hear a little bit more about about how that came about. You said you're lucky. Where was the luck? Where was the skill? You know, I think it's uh, the luck is that it closed two months ago. <laughs> because <laughs> if, if it didn't we we definitely would have been in trouble so so yeah we we initially had raised three three million dollars prior to that and and now we closed a six million round uh for this round we wanted to raise three million dollars that was a year ago the round got five times oversubscribed so we got wow. 15 and a half million dollars of investors who wanted to come in so then we had to make a decision. Do we raise a bigger round or just stick with our 3 million? And, and, and it sounds like a good problem to have, but it, it is a problem because you are diluting yourself at a fairly lower valuation, right? Yeah, yeah for sure. Uh, so long story short, we decided to go with six. And it was a bit tricky for us because we got a few uh, financial investors who wanted to come in. Uh, mm -hmm. And we like VCs, and then we got a few uh, strategic, so automotive people who wanted to come in, and we wanted to really play the right balance between financial and strategic without giving too much power to the strategic guys because that blocks your exit later. We wanted to have someone in Saudi as well as someone in the UAE and some internet. Oh. Like it was like almost a dream wish list, which thankfully eventually we ended up closing, but it took us a year of back and forth and, and wow. figuring out how to do it. And would you say the um, finding that balance, you know, we, we talk a lot about, you know, there's for a lot of people, it's just finding any funders. When you have that, that choice, um, was part of the discussion also, you know, what the funders could bring to you? Because I suppose you had, you know, you were in, in a quite a strong bargaining position. Um, what, yeah. what kind of, did you have anything that you could push back onto funders and say, actually, you know, this is what we want from you guys? Yeah, so we, we, we did that, especially with the strategics, right? Because, you know, the value of having strategic investors is, is all the soft stuff. Mm -hmm. But uh, we pushed out, we, we, we pushed against um, a lot of things in terms of what we want from you and what we cannot give you. And quite a few investors dropped off along the way. So out of the 15 million, you know, probably 6 million dropped off because of the stuff we pushed against. And mm -hmm. we were okay with that because we had alternatives, but you know, even when you do, it actually feels bad. Like <laughs> when a big investor <laughs> yeah, says, okay, yeah. like I can't do that. I'm out. You're like, oh, you know, even if you have the money, it still, it still doesn't feel good. Yeah. The other, the other luckiness we had is again, because I came from a VC background, mm. uh, I'm a venture partner now with Faisalia Group. I'm a venture partner with Nuat, this new Wamba, Wamba team going on board. So coming with that background really just helps me think the same way they think and really, because they have a language, they have boxes they need to tick mm. you know, and, and some stories, you know, tick for them better than others. And it's, I mean, it's, it's, I'm not going to say it's not fair. It's fair. It, it is what it is like, but basically if you have that mindset and you tell the story in the right way that clicks with them, your chances of raising money are much higher. Remember, we raised our initial $3 million. We barely had a product. We had only 20,000 users and, and, and the team was four people, right? So yeah. uh, even now when we raised the 6 million, when we started the discussion, we have like tiny revenue. So uh, you can do a lot more if, if you do things right. You know, it's, there is a difference in terms of how you pitch things, who do you pitch it to, the relationships you have. It's not just purely, okay, you're in this box, that's what you can get. You're in that box, that's what you get. And do you think the, those, those relationships obviously would, you know, being coming from that background, and you know, I think what you were saying about talking their language is, is, is super important. Do you think it also gave you a certain amount of credibility um, in their eyes because you as a leader, you know, know what they're looking for and as such are better placed to, to, to deliver on it? Yeah, for sure, actually. Like, I haven't thought of it from that angle, but yeah, 100%. So it's, it's I, would, I would say the right things that they would want to think of. So it's not just about saying the right things just from a marketing or packaging perspective, but it's really from a business and, and analysis perspective as well. And, mm. and that's what I think gives you credibility. The other thing is I've been in this VC industry since 2010 when it all first started. So I have good relationship with them. So you get that credibility that, hey, we've been in the trenches in this for a while. So 
yeah, that yeah, also yeah. helps. So one of the, the big things that um, Ash Labs gets asked about are pitch decks. And obviously you've, you've seen, you must have seen a fair amount of pitch decks in your, in your day, both on the VC side. Um, yeah. what, you know, what would you say are the most important uh, slides in a pitch deck? Um, and like, what's the one that you should never leave out? Or what's the one that um, people often don't, have, don't put in, but is super valuable to, to include? So I think there's the standard, like, you know, outline of a pitch deck, you know, talk about the problem, talk about your solution, talk about the size of the market, talk about your competition, and then some financials. So I think you have to have all of these things in there. And I yeah. think the one that's really understated is the problem side of things. Mm -hmm. And uh, people don't really talk about the real problem they're solving enough in pitch decks. And I think it's because, you know, they want to focus on the growth and the potential and all of that. And VCs don't consciously think, oh, I want to look for the problem slide. But what the problem slide does is it helps tell the story. Because that's, once, once the VCs understand the problem and then understand your solution, everything from there flows. As long mm -hmm. as it's a big enough market and it's monetizable, then the rest almost is meaningless, right? It's, it's just a question, can you execute or not? Right. Yeah. So a lot of startups focus on this is a globally a $50 billion industry and we are here and we can capture part of that. And if we get zero point, like, like no one knows what you're going to do or what you're going to capture mm. or how it's going to look like. So stop, you know, drilling so deep on those, you know, financials and financial modeling and whatever and focus more on the, you know, the product and what you're doing. And mm. what a lot of startups don't do enough particularly at the early stage is share traction numbers and KPIs, right? Mm. So basically really like, even if you have 10 users, they think that, oh, 10 users is not enough. There's nothing for me to share. There is, I mean, there are 10 users, you know, how many minutes are they spending on your product or app or website? Uh, are they coming back? Uh, are they transacting? So, so, you know, you can get something from even a very small number of users and those KPIs are basically your story. It's, it's, it's the proof that you've built a decent enough product to raise money, to develop it even more, and then to grow it from there onwards. So kind of reading between the lines of, in, in what you just said there, what's, it's super critical for startups to be capturing that data, you know, trying actually oh, yeah. rec recognizing that the users really are the, the thing that people are investing in because yeah. that's what that you need. And, now, really early on, making sure you're super clear in what your KPIs are. I mean, when I used to, as a, a kind of finance professional supporting startups, it was so often there, you know, like you said, they would have so much on the market, but when they talked about their users, they, will, they really lack the depth of uh, knowledge to be able to really build a strong case. Yeah, yeah, 100%. So, and, and, and that, that's a really good point because what a lot of startups focus on, focus on very early in their journey is, the product and growth. They want to show that, yeah, we're growing and we're getting users and, you know, the product is, has so many cool features and they really undervalue the, the KPIs there it's because to, to catch those KPIs, you need to build your product in a way that is collecting that data, right? Mm. So you don't put the effort or have the mindset to actually do it from the start. You'll have those users, but you wouldn't know what they're doing on your platform. You might have some high level stuff from Google Analytics but if, yeah. if you haven't really put the effort to really catch that or even spoken with them and, and, and all that, then, then you miss out a lot. Mm. And I think, I mean, I'm sure given your background in consultant and VC, you can, you see it from the other side. I mean, you, you can see why a lot of people starting on their journey, maybe undervalue that. And I think, you know, that's why kind of trying to listen to other mistakes made by, by others. Um, and the other question we get asked a lot, and I'd be interested in your thoughts is um, there are lots of, organizations out there who you can pay and they'll do your pitch deck for you and they'll make it look super pretty and you know super high tech and where where would you stand in terms of presenting you know, do you think that let's say it could be anywhere from a thousand to five thousand uh dollars um is a good investment um when you when you saw pitch decks which were i suppose less slick and, and maybe more um kind of rough and ready where do you think there is that's a good investment or, or do you think that's the, the money could be spent better elsewhere like if you're hiring those people to to help you tell the story then no 
because you're the best person to tell your own story. If you're hiring those people to really make it look pretty, then yeah, by all means, because it does make a difference, right? Like if you get a if you get a deck that looks like you know graphs out of you know Microsoft Excel, Excel or whatever that you know, and the font is off, and you know we have different sizes of like it it it's not about you know it it shows the lack of attention to details and when you're selling an idea and a product you know you want to know that the you know the team cares about these small details so i think it does it's a very good investment if if you can't make it pretty yourself mm. you're not an ex consultant or <laughs> whatever like make sure you get it you know to to look good by by using some of these services yeah and then and then last question on funding sorry sorry one one, one more thing on that yeah. the best pitch ever is a is a product demo if if i have to actually you know not look at any of the decks or whatever and just like go over a product demo that's an impressive it it speaks 10 times better than you know 50 slides if you just open the screen and say hey go go find the car and look how easy it is like that's the mm. most powerful thing you can have yeah i think that um yeah, the, the the kind of proof in the pudding, and saying that this yeah. is this is how it, this how it works is so important. I had a um a friend who was having a startup and wanted to build this AI powered app, and he he completely as 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 you say wanted to be able to demonstrate it, but didn't have any of the funding to be able to demonstrate it. So he had a couple of his colleagues in a room around the corner, effectively yeah. being the AI, so that when yeah, they yeah, were yeah. when they were presenting it, it looked like it was working, but yeah. actually there was three people around the corner like. Yeah constantly doing this to try to um, think. And I think sometimes you do need to have that kind of yeah. industry. That's totally about, fine. Yeah, make it happen kind of thing. It's, um, yeah, yeah. Fake it till you make it. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> One of the things I think will be super interesting as well is um, how do you make contacts with those, those first VCs? So, you know, you might have had early traction and you've got a, an MVP out that's starting to, to, to work. What, what would your advice be about people looking to try to engage with um, investors, whether it be institutional, uh, strategic, VCs? You know, cold emails can often be you know, a, hard, a hard process because you, you send out loads and you hear nothing. What would be your, you know, your best steps to, to make those connections to start the conversation? You know, I'm, I'm, I'm usually all for you know, uh, bang your head against the wall till it breaks kind of thing, but I really don't think those cold emails are... are a good use of any entrepreneur's time. Like I would spend that time and effort really trying to find someone who's close to one of those VCs who can do a warm introduction or send the deck themselves. It's, it's, you know, investment of your time wise, that's, that would give you a much better return than sure. Cause they, they get a billion of these emails and uh, mm -hmm. it's very hard to stand out. But then again, the region is small. I mean, I'm, I guarantee you every entrepreneur is, is one degree away from a partner in every VC, right? Like they know someone who knows that guy. So mm. figure out who that someone is and let them connect you, you know? Mm. Interesting. Um, so one thing I wanted to move on to next, your uh, co-founder. Sorry, 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 one more thing on that. No, 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 please. And always try to go to the senior people in those funds. It's obvious, yeah. but like it makes the difference between night and day. Like I, I would have people tell me, oh, I send this and this guy and in, in this VC is looking at it and he's an analyst and I, they don't have any decision power. Like they don't have a decision power to move it up or down. They just, you know, put it with the flow. They might, you know, say five words about it in their weekly meeting. And then if it gets killed, they just move on. Right. So mm -hmm. try, you know, put the extra effort to get it to, to the more senior people. And I think, like I think, you, you, to a certain extent, you need a cheerleader. You need someone who yeah. is important and outside of your direct organization who will bang the drum for you. Because I think there's a lot, lot of benefit in it, not just being, hey, I think this is amazing, but hey, this other person also thinks it's amazing and, and you think they're, uh, you know, they're clever. I think you know those... why? You know why that's very important? Because every tech company, every startup, every, there's 50 billion reasons to kill it. Right, like, and to think it's crap and it's not going to work, right? I mean, think of I don't know Airbnb when they started having people sleep on your couch. Like, you can you can easily argue that's the stupidest thing out there, right? And if you don't have that internal champion, it's some smart ass on the investment team is going to throw out an idea, kill it, and then move on. So you need that someone that would 
put up, I mean, not, not, not kill themselves for it, but put up a small fight for, for, for your passport. Yeah, for sure. Um, so your co-founder, Andre Cabrit, is that pronounced properly? I probably ruined his pronunciation. Andrew, Andrew yeah. Andrew. Um, interesting, I think, uh, relationships with co-founders. How, how does that work um, kind of practically day to day? Um, would, you, would you always think for entrepreneurs that actually having kind of a strong co-founded team is, is important? You know, you get quite a few solo, solo founders and, and the, the difficulties there. Um, love to hear a bit of your thoughts about that. Yeah. So he's my nephew, right? So for me, it's easy. If he, if he doesn't do what I want, I just call my brother and tell him. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but like, uh, so A, I think, I mean, you know, YC, like Y Combinator always, you know, really is, is adamant about having, you know, at least two founders and all that. I don't think it's a deal breaker. I mean, I think you can do it. It's harder. It's harder, I think, more so psychologically than, than practically, right? Mm. Uh, unless you know your co-founder is a big techie guy and you're a business guy and it's totally complementary, then yeah, there there is you know like uh, business value out of it. But you know if you're both designers or whatever, I think it's really more psychological you know support than you know because mm. you, you need to bounce ideas, you need someone to challenge you, you need someone to tell you it's going to be okay sometimes. So so having that person with you throughout the journey is I think from that angle is extremely important yeah yeah there was there's a lot of I think you read uh, all of the books around this space and they always say look for a co-founder who has complementary skills you know if you're yeah. if you've got tech you but I, I think I, I think I agree with you I think personality and actually being able to you know those days where it all seems to be going wrong and you want to throw in the towel having someone who can say like hey come on let's go and have a cup of coffee or a beer yeah. or whatever it may be and, and say, let's, we'll fight this again tomorrow. I think that, that kind yeah. of relationship is super important. 100%. How many, how many, uh, I think they, they call it desert days. How many desert days do you think you have, uh, had, uh, is it kind of once a week or is it now, now that you're a bit further on, is it slightly more, uh, less so frequent? The, super frequent, man. So, <laughs> you know, in startups, everybody says, you know, the highs are so high and the lows are so low. But yeah. what they don't tell you is 90% of the time it slows and they're so low, you know, <laughs> uh, honestly, like, uh, like occasionally you get the good news and you're jumping and stuff, but you know, an average day is, is tough, you know, yeah. <laughs> like there are so many more things that can go wrong than, than there are things that can go right. Yeah. I think it's, I think it's so interesting where, you know, the idea of being an entrepreneur sounds like, you know, it's dreamlike, you know, you can be, have this amazing lifestyle, you're raising all this money, but the realities of it are, are often very different. Yeah. I have, I have, I have a quote, a friend of mine, he's an entrepreneur. He said it to me. It's, it's my favorite quote of all time. I'm going to put it out there because there are a few entrepreneurs listening and, and if someone doesn't know it, I think it's a really cool one to know. He said in startup world, you, you have to, stay alive long enough to get lucky. And I think it's the most true sentence about yeah. entrepreneurship, right? It's basically, and, and that, that encompasses everything, right? Like raising enough money to continue getting the right team, like just making sure you, you float around long enough until you know, that lucky opportunity comes, you're in the right mm. place at the right time in the right market, and then you grab it and if, if you're smart and then you make something out of it. Yeah. Yeah, that kind of just survived through the, the bad times, which is, uh, yeah. you know, more than now, more than ever, also incredibly, incredibly important. Um, so how big is your team now? So obviously started with you and, and um, Andre. Where, Andrew, Andrew, sorry. Um, where, where are you and how's, how has that grown? Has it been a kind of steady one, two, three, four, five? Has it had ups and downs? Yeah, so we're 24, 24 people now. Wow. Uh, it it was fairly steady. I mean, we, we started off as we brought in the Danish engineers to Dubai. There were five of us. So we kept that for a while. Then we grew to nine people and we kept that for a year and a half almost. And then in the last six months, we hired 15 people. So, <laughs> so we went from nine to 24, like recently, because we knew we were raising money. We, we had a lot of projects that we were working on. So yeah. we needed to grow the team to, to support that. Our team is pretty weird weirdly uh, split out so we have eight people in dubai mm -hmm. we have an office in uh, in beirut we have uh, eight seven eight people there 
And then our tech team is, uh, works remotely from Denmark, uh, sorry, from Europe. So uh, quite a few of them in Denmark, Germany, uh, Italy, and France. Uh, so when this whole uh, work from home remote thing hit recently, is these guys didn't change anything. <laughs> yeah. It's pretty easy for them. Uh, the Lebanese team, because there's been quite a bit of trouble going on in Lebanon since October, they were also half working remotely. Yeah. So um, we were fairly okay with this. Like Zoom and Slack were home for us, you know, a while back already. Yeah. Yeah. I saw there was a there was a funny post on Instagram I saw which said. Um, the digital transformation in your organization was driven by A, the CEO, B, the CTO, or C, uh -huh. coronavirus. And I think uh, for lots of organization, uh, the C is probably the case. <laughs> yeah, um, that's the right C. Yeah, exactly. Interesting that you said a lot of your tech team is based in Europe. Um, I think the assumption for many people is often you outsource your tech teams to, I suppose, um, cheaper locations, you know, whether it be kind of India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, um, which have really strong tech um, infrastructure. What was that? What was the choice to kind of keep it in Europe? Um, and is that was that based on quality, price, um, availability? So we we didn't outsource it, right? So they're they're full time employees with us. I think if we outsourced it, we would have probably gone with a cheaper <laughs> option. Yeah. Uh, but we initially we needed a lot of AI skills, and my Andrew with his network in Denmark managed to get you know three right, four right, right. Danish engineers. And it started there and then we're like, okay, they came to Dubai, they lived here for a year and a half, they hated it, so they went back to Denmark. And then when they went back, we wanted to hire more developers and then we're like, okay, you know, the guys are in Denmark and it's working, why not have a guy in Germany? And we did mm. that, then a guy in France and one of the Danish guys moved to France and yeah, just grew organically that way. Mm. And and what, what do you find the biggest, I think more and more companies will be moving to remote working and I think this this change will, will, will cause that development. What would be your, your best tips for working with a team remotely? I suppose, particularly around quality and ensuring quality um, and engagement. So there's all, all the obvious stuff, you know, communication, uh, make sure you have the right tool. Although I think the most important one, honestly, is hire the right people for that. Because not everyone is, is can self-motivate, can, you know, be, have really high work ethics in terms of, you know, making sure they're putting in the time and effort and hours and all that. And if you just don't hire the right people from the start for that, then it's a big headache for you and for them because yeah. you're going to spend all your time and effort making sure they're doing the job and, and all that. So I think, you know, it, it's not for everybody. and It doesn't make those people bad people. They're just, you know, they need a different type of structure or management. And, and, and yeah, for some people, they, they operate well. They like working with their own setup from home. Uh, they manage their own time. We have, we give pretty, you know, we have a lot of flexibility even before coronavirus. So people could work from home. They could work remotely. We have unlimited vacation days. So literally people act as if they're, you know, owners in the business and decide how they want to split their time, what they want to do, as long as they deliver on, on what they should deliver. Mm. So you um, just had the big, the big round close. You hired uh, a load more staff. What does the next uh, 12 months look like for you on a kind of very practical sense? Um, interested in your thoughts on how coronavirus is going to affect the economy, your business in particular, um, and what that, what that kind of, yeah, the kind of 12 month horizon. Yeah. So we had a 12 month horizon that went down the drain two weeks ago. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's the whole world is changing. I, I don't know how long this thing is going to last. I don't know how the world is going to look like by the end of it, but people will continue to buy cars. One, once this is over, you know, people will go out and buy cars. I think it will move much more digitally than, than it was. And, and that's good for us because that's what we do. So from that angle, I think there is an opportunity there for us. Uh, mm. Dealerships are much more open right now to explore digital solutions than they were you know, six months ago. So we're trying to play that card and really, you know, like uh, make lemonade out of, <laughs> out of what's going on. Mm. Uh, and, and there will be demand. It will be there. Like if, if you wanted to buy a car now, you're going to postpone it. You're not going to cancel it. Right. And then when this is over, everybody that accumulated during that period will go back out and buy cars. So we're fairly hopeful. A big part of our business is the actual brands like the BMWs of the world. 
So we just hope that, you know, by the end of this thing, they have enough money to, you know, engage our services versus they're like, <laughs> you know, so deep in trouble that they don't want to spend anything on anything. Yeah. Um, other than that, I think the industry for us will recover and for automotive generally will, will work out. Yeah. And with your, with your other hat on, I suppose, coming back from kind of the, the VC, the kind of venture partner hat, um, is it a similar case where people are just holding, holding to see how things, um, until things recover a little bit? What, what's kind of your feel about kind of the actual uh, funders side? It's going to be extremely hard to raise money right now. Like it's, 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 it's obvious, but I, I'm getting a lot of people that are saying, Hey, can you connect me with this? As, as if it's, there is a good chance. There's like, I don't want to say zero because it's never zero, but there's probably a 1% chance you would raise money right now because the VC funds who have the money, A, are either still trying to figure out what the hell is going on and they're probably raising their future funds and now they don't know what's going there. So their focus is not really on let's make new investments. And their B, they want to conserve a big part of their cash for their existing portfolio where they've already invested. They want to make sure that hey, if we want to follow up for those guys, let's make sure we have a good pocket right there. And the strategics are all businesses and, and their conglomerates and, you know, retail and automotive and banking. And all these guys are like, you know, in, you know, up to their knees now with, with all everything going on, their financials dip. They're not in a state where they, okay, let's look at what we can invest in. That said, you know, in theory, it's the perfect time for VCs because they can probably get really good deals out there at a mm -hmm. discount, you know, and uh, it's true. I mean, it's sad, but it's, it, it is what it is from an investment perspective. If you have the mindset and the money and the cash and all that, you can actually, you know, especially at the earlier stage, you can get, you know, pretty early stage company at a really amazing valuation. And then they become the next Uber or BNB or whatever. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Um, okay. Anyone on the call? We're going to, I've got one more question then I'm going to take some questions. So either um, put it in the chat or if you can um, either come off mute and, and ask your, your question. Um, so yeah, please, please get ready with your questions if, if you have any, have any, but kind of following up on that um, tag, the valuations is always something that comes up um, quite, quite a lot of the questions that come up around how do you, you kind of value early on? Um, what would be your, your tips in terms of, valuation of, of, of companies my that, biggest that too, learning too, too broad yeah i know it's, it's it's a very question my biggest learning honestly for us in the last year don't worry so much about valuation like like so many founders get so hung up on valuation it's mm the most important thing like i'm going to tell you yeah i get the right investor blah 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 honestly the most important thing is speed right closing the round quickly is the most important thing because the longer it drags 10 million things are going to go wrong and then things are going to go bad and you're going to lose the money right? like make sure you if you can if you have any control over it you know forego valuation for the sake of speed because I've never seen a deal where, where nothing went wrong. And, and it, it, it varies from it. I, I promise you whether, you know, some guy on the board, his brother passes away and then they can't invest anymore or a, a fund, one of their other startups gets into trouble and they stop replying or like, there's mm. always something. So just close quickly. That's the most important thing that you can do if, if you mm. have any control over it. So don't sweat the valuation. It's, you know, Usually it's not a huge swing. It's like 10, 15% here and there. Uh, the founders probably end up owning less than 50% after that. So 10 to 15% is really 5% for you eventually. And then look at the grander scheme of thing, yeah? Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, if anyone's got any questions, uh, please come off mute now. I've got, I've got loads more. I mean, this is super interesting for me. Hopefully it's interesting for you guys out there as well. Um, does anyone have any questions that they specifically would like to ask? Um, we've got a message from Assad. Um, what is the benchmark for seed Series A's investments in terms of revenue? So it depends on your business, right? Like some, some businesses. So the way I look at it from, a, from an investment perspective is once you get to Series A, you need to have one of those three things 
in place, either revenue in a good shape or a large number of users or some kick-ass technology, right? That's, that's, that's what investors will be investing in. It's either the tech is really so out there. You know, you have companies with zero revenue getting bought at $1 billion because they have amazing technology. Then you have companies like uh, WhatsApp with zero revenue getting bought at $19 billion because they have so many users. And then you have companies that are getting bought for their capital. Revenue per se is not as important. It's what's important. I mean, why, why revenue does matter is it proves that people want your product. It proves that they're willing to pay for it. And it proves that that part of your business is growing. So you're really saying, hey, you know, we've raised $1 million. We achieved, you know, $1 million in revenue. If we get five more, we can make that $10 million. And we've proven that people are paying, they're coming back. And, and it's, it's, it's more of an KPI than a cash flow thing because investors are not going to start taking dividends out of your revenue at that stage, right? So it's mm. more of a proof of concept than, than really cash flow. Mm. Super interesting. Um, we've got a couple more questions coming in, then I'm flooding in. You'll be pleased to know. Um, a shout out for your energy and vibe. So uh, you're clearly coming across well, Tarek. I mean, it's probably someone from my team, man. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, what's the greatest challenge uh, that your business is facing at the moment? So right maybe, now, out, I mean, maybe outside of um, coronavirus. So for us, it's really, so we, we've cracked a few business models along the way. The biggest challenge we're facing right now is figuring out which one is the right business model to double down on? Because there are so many ways you can make money in our business on cars, you know? And it sounds like a good thing. It's, it, it's not because there's little money here, little money there. But basically, we're trying to figure out what is the biggest bucket that is uncapped. So one of the products we have is data. It's a SaaS product, right? We mm -hmm. sell it to the BMWs of the world. That's amazing. It's easy for us to sell. It's pure margin. We don't have to pay marketing. And it's recurring revenue. So... From that angle, it's, oh, wow, this thing is great. These guys cracked it. It's perfect. But then you step back and you say, okay, how many dealerships are there in the country? 20 people, 20 dealerships? Mm. That doesn't scale. So we're continuously you know, figuring stuff out and then stepping back and thinking, okay, how can we move to the next phase where it achieves all these things? It's, it's, there's a lot of revenue. It's a big market. It can scale. It's uncapped. And there's big profit margins in it. So really figuring that stuff along the way and, and really iterating. Mm. Fantastic. Um, we've got two questions from Nicholas, which I'm going to come to shortly, but um, Asad, you've raised your hand. Have you got a question you'd like to ask? If you would like, do you want to come off mute? Uh, or maybe you just, is the question, I hope you asked a question in the group, so maybe, maybe it was that. Um, let me know in the chat if you want to ask another question. Um, so two really interesting questions from Nicholas. The first one is, um, what's your view of the value of an accelerator can bring in helping your business um, getting ready for investment? Um, and I, I know there are lots out there, some that um, are paid for, some that take a percentage, um, some that do it from the goodness of their heart. Like what, where do you see um, the value? I think, I think it's extremely valuable if it's the right accelerator. If it's an accelerator, they're just going to give you office space and you don't have like two courses a month that train you, that's useless, like it's zero. But if it's an accelerator that can help you fine tune your story and your product and your pitch and all of that, and can connect you to potential investors or strategic you know, partners later, that's invaluable. It's, it's, it's at that stage, that's exactly what you need. So if they can, like, if it's, if it's a, it doesn't have to be a Y combinator, but it's, if, if it's something that really pushes you in that direction it's uh it's, even sometimes you know one some of these accelerators become a brand name just being part of them gives you that credibility so mm. so it's sort of like doing an mba if you do it in the top five business schools it's a great thing if you do it in number 15 it's almost useless yeah i mean it's interesting i think um i'm very fortunate to speak to quite a lot of uh both successful and unsuccessful entrepreneurs and the word credibility always comes up is you need to have credibility and yeah, you can get it from different ways. Um, but it, it's so important to, to have that. I think it's the same with a, a business, a, a kind of accelerator. Um, the other question from Nicholas, which would be interested is what importance do investors have on social impact, uh, sustainability of an investment, or is it all profit potential? 
That was my honest answer. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm, uh, I think we're going to be disappointed with your uh, honest answer, aren't we? Uh, I don't think they put a lot of weight on it. I mean, everything else being equal, if it does have a social impact, they would go for it, right? Mm -hmm. But they're not going to pick a company that's growing at a slower pace over another company because this one has a social angle to it. Uh, unless some funds have a social mandate and, yeah. and if, if that is their strategy, that's a different story. Yeah, I think I think I would completely mirror that. I know I know less about the the market here in the UAE. Back in the UK, it was exactly the same. We had a couple of some of the big VCs who have a specific strand for social investments, um, but that was really about looking at their over, over, overall portfolio and as an organisation saying they want to make more of a social impact um, rather than a kind of a strong business decision. And I think for me, the biggest challenge for socially minded investments is to be as competitive as those that aren't. And I think that's where we, where exactly. we, crack, we crack it. I think asking for um, additional benefit because of that Just social because, impact, yeah. yeah, I think it's, I think it's only ever going to restrict the market and we need to break through. I'm, I'm, I'm very passionate about um, social impact. So I'll talk about this for hours. <laughs> but, um, yeah, I'll interview you. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's a, a super interesting uh, part of it. Um, so a question from Mohammed. Um, what do VCs mainly look for in a founder is it strategic abilities, tech skills, network? Muhammad, that is a fantastic question. Um, so the, yeah, really so, understanding the, the person. I don't think it's, it's tech because you can always hire for that. And I don't think it's the network because you know, you have some really young founders who've done amazing stuff when they have zero network. I mean, mm. if you're weak on the network side, that's where your VCs can, can help out. Uh, I think it's a strategic, direction he said or strategic thinking or whatever. abilities yeah abilities so i think that's out of those three i think that's the most important and, and honestly i think it's it's the ability to tell a story and and the ability to have a grand vision you know no one wants to invest in a lifestyle business they want they want at least a five percent chance that what you're pitching them can be a billion dollar idea someday and the third thing i think they look for is is you know, your ability to, to have business acumen to really, you know, not get too married to the product and stuff and really understand that this needs to translate into a business in, in some form. Mm. Super interesting. Look, we've got five minutes left um, and I'm sure we both could go on for hours. It's been really interesting to speak to you. So I've got a, one last question that I'd, I'd love to ask and then I think we're going to wrap it up for the, and we can all go off and hopefully enjoy the exciting weekend. Um, I think it's always interesting to look at how much luck and fate played a part on, on your journeys. You know, you, you think back to you seeing that it was, it was a mini that you saw and took a photo and, and, and had that discussion. You know, if that person who had that mini happened to park in the street, one, one to the left, yeah. would, you, would you, what impact would that? So I'd love to hear about, I suppose, on your journey, how much do you think luck paid a, a massive part of it? How much was it like skill, determination, um, and, and that, that, yeah. kind of, that balance. So I think there's, there's two angles to that. I think there's, you know, you need that spark to start the business. I think there is luck there. Like it happened. I saw that many that day, blah, blah, blah. But I think in that sense, if, if the mindset and the will is there, you will get other opportunities. If I didn't see a mini, I could have seen, I don't know, like, a burger and I said, Oh, let's do something with the food or something like, like once yeah. you want to do something, you will actually find that spark that, that ignites it. But then within the journey, it's, it's tremendous. L luck is everything. Like, uh, oh. honestly, like hard work and blah, blah, blah is, 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 you know, gets you if with luck, it, get, it, it creates success, but without any luck, it's, it's, um, it won't work. Like their luck is a huge part of it. Like, our initial strategic investor was a guy that Andrew ran into in a conference. Once he gave him his card, we emailed him, boop, that happened. We got a German VC. Uh, I met him on an investment committee of a uh, Faisalia group in Saudi. He was sitting, he happened to be sitting next to me, yeah. showed him the app. He emailed me later, like, like literally uh, almost every single success thing that happened uh, has it's either pure luck or has a luck factor into it. Mm -hmm. 
And then you, you talked a little bit about some of the skills that you think are important. So you've talked about storytelling and being able to tell, tell your own story. What would you, what would you say, um, maybe if you were looking back at yourself um, at the start of your journey and you were your own mentor, what would you be, you know, what was the advice to get? Like, what is it? Is it about building your network, trying to get yourself out there so you can be lucky? I mean, I think there's always really interesting in being in the right places. And that often means yeah. going to lots of wrong places to be in the right yeah. places. You know, what, what would be the advice to, if you were talking to yourself um, at the start? So, so yeah, that, that's a really good one because I keep pushing my tech team to do what you just said, right? So, and they're younger guys. So for me, it's almost giving advice to them giving it to myself as a younger self it's it's putting yourself out there to catch and find those opportunities right like you would have some random guy who says hey i'm in town for one day can you meet me for coffee and you're really busy and you can't see anything that you can get out of that guy mm. but then push yourself go, go for that coffee you know like uh, he might say a word that you know eight out of ten will lead nowhere and it would waste your time two of them will click, but you need to be prepared to really connect these dots, you know, like go with the mindset that, you know, I want to explore what, what can be done with this guy. And often enough, you know, after 10 meetings, 10 useless meetings in your mind, when you first started, two of them will be amazingly valuable for you. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I agree. I think there's, you have to be in you know what's the phrase about kissing a lot of frogs before you find the prince i think it's uh i, I like the kissing frogs part our logo is a frog so <laughs> yeah I, I that was obviously completely on purpose Derek. that was very uh, nice way to end the call yeah exactly <laughs> kiss the frog um, <laughs> okay well thank you very much Derek, for joining i've been um super interesting some really great questions from from the group so thanks for um, having me thanks everyone i really appreciate your time and uh and we'll speak soon perfect bye perfect. Thank you, everyone. Bye.